We went on down to Cheyenne River after we went to Greengrass, came back, and we were there on, I think it was the 3rd of September when they first uh, turned those dogs, and that, uh, it was, mm -hmm. I think it was September 3rd. Mm -hmm. It yes. was the same, it was the anniversary of the Whitestone uh, Hill Massacre. Very interesting, in 1863, on that very date, they had uh, uh, massacred the uh, combined camp of Ahantua and Hunkpapa, uh, who were camped there at White Stone, uh, White Stone Hill. So fast forward, I mean, fast forward to 2015 is when they had this uh, return the dogs and, and pier gas, etc., on their relatives there. And then again, we went, I think it was <clears throat> late in October, is when we carried this message back from United Religious Initiative, which I think is quite a quite an incredible letter and what they gave. But my my relationship goes to Standing Rock. My father was born uh, along Oak Creek at Wakpala. Mm. Wakpala, of course, is uh, is a community uh, in uh, South Dakota, uh, not far from from Mobridge. And it was Bobby Jean Three Legs uh, from Wakpala, the young young uh, Takoja there, that had the vision and dream that led to this whole thing. And it was the community of Wakpala, their elders and young people, who first uh, carried the message across the bridge into Mobridge to alert the people there. Of course, they didn't listen. And then, of course, Bobby Jean and others, but from Wakpala, uh, in fact, they went actually to the uh, former site of the home of Chief Gall, PZ. And of course, Gall was the, the uh, Itasha there, the chief there. And so they call Wakpala the people of Chief Gall, the people of Gall. And then across, across, over across the Chain Buttes there, you have uh, the Tonka Yotonka's camp, Sitting Bull was over on that side. That's in Little Eagle. Uh, that's where I Sundance been back starting in 1980. <laughs> so you have those two. And then you have up towards Cannonball. Those are actually a Hongtua. Those are not Hunkpapas. They're Dakotas. They're re directly related to uh, Toja, I mean, Hunkashi, Ejna, down into Yankton. Those are, are so, th so where that was at Cannonball, those are a Hongtua, uh, Dakota speaking versus Lakota speaking right up to Wakpala, speak with an L. So how, how would you like, how would you, do you, are you gonna interview me or do you want me just to start? Or how, do, how would you like to do this? Uh, I have some questions. I don't know how, what, you, I mean, I would like to- No, I think it'd be good. I think it's better to have a dialogue. Mm. Maybe you can ask me how, how, my, how was I connected or whatever and just have a dialogue. Mm -hmm. Well, I um, when I was there, um, we were all sharing that. I was actually there the same day. That was, uh, I got there like at midnight the night before the dog attacks. Mm -hmm. And um, just instantly uh, felt like I was coming home to a home that I never knew. Mm -hmm. Deep in my heart. When I walked up on the drums and the fire that night of coming in, it was, yes. I just sobbed. And it was it was a life changing moment for me, um, and the experience of the next day was extremely powerful. Um, being at the fire, and um, I actually have a recording that it might be. Did you speak that night at the fire at the sacred fire of the dog attacks? I, I so. think that I have a recording of yours that I was actually wanting to incorporate into this piece because what you were speaking about or what was being speak about was about a law, a law of the people to recognize natural law and for us to like just stand beyond like the political systems and the permissions and this and that and for like it was like you were calling for just this beautiful thing that is actually exactly what is happening with these uh, codes and it was just very moving I mean I my iPod got stolen so I lost everything else except the audio tracks and I was been listening to that and it's such a beautiful uh, 
beautiful place and really prophetic to where we're at today. Um, my I was doing uh, supply runs and then ended up getting involved with um, the nonprofit Indigenous Vision to help support and getting sustainable water for the winter. Mm -hmm. Came to flourishing. Um, but that was my work there was doing groundwork for indigenous vision, um, working to get some water. So since we were all sharing our experiences at Standing Rock, that was, that was mine. Um, I had went and doing those missions. So Phil, I, I got to uh, based on what you're saying, Angelique, um, when I got there, uh, I went through the, the, um, police and military roadblocks like everyone else with the rifles in my car and um, with them leaning into my car. So when I got there and I saw the makeup of the people and where I camped, I had a French family on one side. Uh, I had some um, native relatives on the other side. There's a black family behind me. How did you feel about the diversity of the whole thing, Phil? And, and how the uh, various tribal people managed to get along so beautifully? Well, I, I really, um, the understanding that, that we're human beings uh, versus breaking people up and dividing them was something I think was very much part of, of the uh, um, perspective of, of the Ahantua in terms of understanding that we are one human family. Now there's certainly differences, but I felt feel like the people who came, the people who came to Standing Rock were attracted by the same spirit that that initiated Standing Rock, so to speak. It was a, like a magnet that brought together people of like vision, like values, like uh, you know, similar understanding. And so I think whether or not you were black or red or yellow or white or whatever. And I think where it's a time has come, personally for myself, I think the time's come that we have to begin seeing each other as souls. Souls. Jim Graybear, soul. Angelique, soul. Ejna, soul. Meaning that a soul has no ethnicity, it has no gender, it has no difference. I mean, it's, it's a reflection of the one as the creator. We're souls. And I think the sooner we begin to understand that and communicate to each other as a soul, each one of us then, then we come from a place of oneness, understanding we're a soul. At the same time, each soul has its own unique collective contributions to make. But still, we need to see ourselves as a soul, a sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. Each one of us. When we transcend that understanding, then we step out of all this duality. Because duality is simply the source of dissension, disunity. It's that oneness, that understanding of oneness. And I think that's what people felt there. They felt oneness. They felt at home. They felt they'd come home to their soul. And that doesn't say that everything was perfect. You know, but in essence, I think, why did all those people come from all over? Because it attracted their soul, their spirit. Mm. Yeah. Great answer. That's kind of what I felt too. And I, and I hear now more and more people speaking that way, which really um, is a good thing. My, I was talking to my chief this morning. Two dog, he's down in Kentucky, you know, United Western Lenape. And it could have been the same talk, Phil. It's mm -hmm. exactly what he was sharing on a radio show. So the more that you, you who are the leaders of this can share that, I think the better chance we have of, of moving ahead in a good way. Yes. And now, is that Rick Two Dogs? So there's, there's, there's Rick and then he has a Charles. Friend. Charles. Charles Two, two Dog, yeah. Charles, okay, Charles. That must now. How's he related to Rick? I'm not sure. I don't yeah, know. Now, now, Rick, we said now. This has been a while though. Rick used to lead a Sundance down in Pine Ridge. Yes, probably 20 years ago. I don't know if he's still leading a Sundance down there or how he's doing. Or 
I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, hmm. Charles. Now, where's where's whereabouts is Charles? He's in Kentucky. Oh, in Kentucky. Yeah, not far from Franklin. I'm going to have to connect him up when you open the center because he needs yeah. to come visit you. Yeah. Now, now I'm just curious. Um, where Franklin? How close is that to Lexington? I don't think it's far. It can't be that far. Well, what it would be good? What it would be great to introduce us because um, I'm happy we, to. Sure. We go down that way from time to time. I know. Yeah, I know. Okay, I'll make a note and we'll do that. Okay. Yeah, Chief, I would like to ask a question. Um, <clears throat> For as we move into this new paradigm, I, I can I hear you saying about the soul, but I'm, asking, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, the connection between the water and the divine feminine, and when we're where we're at in the times now as we welcome in and as this rainbow tribe of soul starts to emerge and take the lead. Um, can you speak a little bit about that divine feminine and, and the role and the unity, like how that plays out, not only for Standing Rock, but also in the movement and these initiatives that are taking on in 2021 for World Water Year yes. and World Water Law? Well, most all indigenous ceremonies I know, like Native American Church, for instance, it's the woman who brings in the water at sunrise. So the connection between water and the amniotic sac in which we grow and develop the water. Um, and though that dimension of Mother Earth, uh, I found almost universally is connected to women. That, that, that women, but, but I think even more so that there's a direct connection to the abuse of women and the abuse of Mother Earth. To me, they're one and the same. The, the way that we, and particularly men, men are treating Mother Earth is the way that men uh, treat women in many cases. Now, I think that, that uh, I see men awakening and understanding that the abuse of women, any form, is totally and completely uh, out of alignment with our cultural, spiritual understanding. The eagle has two wings. One is woman, one is man. And until both wings of the eagle have equal power and respect and honor, the eagle of humanity will never fly us, fly will never fly to its highest. So I, I believe this relationship of, if you think about it, so what gives us birth, our mother earth, gives birth to all. What gives birth to all, all our human family, womankind, just as mother earth. Now, when we abuse that which gives us life, in a way, our own mothers, grandmothers, really, we're doing the same thing to Mother Earth. So we have to reflect about this. Would you abuse your mother? Would you poison your mother? Would you cut your mother where she shouldn't be cut? Would you rip up her skin? Would you suck her blood out? Would you put things inside of her and blow her bones up? Of course not. Unless you were really, <laughs> you know, on the skia there. But you know, we do that to our mother, earth, that gives us life, no different, gives, but it gives life to all. And particularly, we know that water, of all the mineral people that we can identify, water is life. Niniwakoni, it is life. And, you know, for those who've gone up and fasted, uh, you know, the food dimension is easy to deal with for me. No, not, not that it's easy, but, you know, you know, it's, it's not that tough, but it's water. It's water. I remember there at Little Eagle, uh, sun dancing there for uh, early 80s with Pete Catches. And I remember 
uh, it was very hot. He liked to dance two days and two nights nonstop. We called two blue days and two, two yellow days. So we were really going at it and um, really hot. Uh, we danced all night long, all day long, all night long. And we're getting up and it was, it was around 10 or 11 in the morning, hot, getting ready to pierce. And I remember during the break, he said, boys, he said, now maybe you can understand water is medicine. Water is medicine. And it should be treated like this. It's sacred. I mean, of course, when you're sitting there and you, your lips are chapped, I mean, your lips are dry, your tongue's thick because you had no water. Of course, you really understand water is medicine. And of course we know it, it can, makes up the majority of our bodies. It's from whence we know uh, life came, emerged from water itself. We came from water, we were born from water. Just like we're born from water within the womb of our mother, it's no different. Because humanity was born of the water. We emerged from the primordial water. And uh, I remember I have this one brother who, who shared with me this perspective, uh, actually in the Cherokee perspective, and I really like it. It says, even our physical being is like water. Like for instance, if I look here, my legs give me strength. My legs here, that's the, you might say that's the, the, the earth. And above the earth is my, is the water. And above the water is the wind. And above that is the fire. And so would you, do you have any words of advice or recommendation or guidance that you could share with us about um, finding that balance of the divine feminine, not only for our male relatives, but also for the female relatives who have experienced that shutdown and that squelching of that energy, um, what would you recommend or what could you um, share for us all on, on both sides of that um, to embrace and reignite and reacquaint ourselves with that divine feminine? Well, first of all, I would say it's a process. It's a process, not an event meaning that we're all in process. And I believe that, that really the only person we can change is ourselves. By changing myself, then that impacts others by how I am. So I would say for, for, for men, for instance, it's, it's time for us, and, and I'm sure many are doing this, I certainly am, to go inside, to go inside and to purify our heart and mind and to also accept the fact that I mean, maybe have a vision of this and I'd say this when you get to be my age 76 you know, and many older than me and you describe a person of that age you say that person's strong and kind and courageous and you, all these spiritual qualities that that you know we hopefully uh, gain as we become elders Still a lot of work to do on my part, so I'm hoping I'll live a long time. But uh, when you when you really ask that question about all these spiritual qualities, what are they, male or female? Well, either. either. So what I see is is let me let me step back. Okay. Um, it, it's my understanding, experience that all those qualities of memory, abstract thought, creativeness, inventiveness, uh, logic, all these qualities are qualities of the soul, our soul, not our bodies. Our soul, not our bodies. And as you, th if you think about it, as we get older, and if we do our best we can to pray and follow that spiritual path, uh, really, you begin to let go of dualism, dualistic things. And you begin to see people more and more like a soul, which has no gender, 
So I would say this, I, I think that we as, as men need to accept ourselves fully, including those qualities that people call feminine. Really, they're human spiritual qualities. And I think the interaction between us as men and women, or however you people feel about that, whatever this interaction helps us all to understand these various qualities and see them in ourselves. If somebody else did not have them to reflect to me, to me how would I know them? So in this process, uh, I believe it starts with differentiation. And that's why you know I've always honored and respected uh, women coming together. Of course, we had that naturally in our societies, women's societies. We had men's societies. It wasn't better than whatever. If we just realized that that differentiation, understanding who we are, or a group over here that that may be Ihankawa, they need to come together, especially at this time, and differentiate, declare who we are. But then we can integrate in novel new ways. But we have to know the pieces first. So we, then we, inter, we integrate. And then eventually we can generalize. The generalization I'm coming to is we're all souls. But we start off with the differentiation of my part. I'm a, I'm a Hantua, I'm Chickasaw. I got some French and English. These dimensions. Then the next step is how does that all fit together? But unless I define clearly who I am and know my own identity, like my father told me always, he said, son, always know where you're coming from. Always know where you're going. Most of all, know who you're traveling with. Know who you're traveling with. So that's what I would say that, that, that first of all, to accept that we as men are balanced in this world today. It's a fact. I mean, look look what's going on. It cut out on my end. I don't know if it cut out on everybody else's. No, that was I fine. Didn't hear the word. No, what I was what I was saying is we have to accept the fact as men that we're really unbalanced. Look at what's going on in the world today. And exactly what's happening is a result of my generation. And other older generations. We're the architects of this. Whether we did anything or didn't do anything, and we can see it's unbalanced. We can see the qualities of, of, of kindness and compassion and nurturing and sensitivity. It needs to increase dramatically in this world we live in. So these ideas of blah, 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 blah. we see a lot of that. We see this is heartless um, greed that's left just in this last few months. 250 million human beings going into extreme poverty, let alone all the ones that are already there. And it's continuing. And it's going to get worse because of the fact that, that the compassion and the feelings of, of compassion and kindness and generosity, not that, by the way, that not that all men are absent of these qualities, but we certainly have been the greatest influencers on where we find ourselves at this point in history. Now, there's another side of this too, which I think uh, a womankind uh, may reflect on. That's that who are the first educators of the child from the very womb, from the time of conception, the mother is. And so we've got to ask ourselves, how is it that a society um, raises their sons to die in war? That raises their sons to, to have that thing to kill people. Now, you, you, it's really interesting, um, this dear uh, uh, Ate, my father, kind of asked to take me on in terms of my spiritual uh, education, Lionel Kinua. Um, he shared a lot of really insightful things with me. And one of the things he said that was, of course, now this is just on the high plains, that our, our greatest act was not killing the enemy. 
it was touching the enemy, touching the enemy. Um, and so really there was relative to what was going on in the place of the world, there was relative little killing. He said that if you kill somebody, the elders, even if there was somebody who was an enemy, quote unquote, they'd ask you, why did you take this person's soul? Why did you do that? And if you were a good shumano, a good horse thief, it wasn't how many horses you brought back. It was the fact you brought horses back without hurting anybody. Because when anybody came back and everybody's so closely related in these extended families, the loss of one relative was huge. It impacted everybody. But at the same time, when they discovered that the military they were fighting against uh, didn't honor this, and they, you can even say, see there was an attempt at one point where they actually made the coup sticks longer to make up for the bayonets. You know, so they could touch the soldier, but then they realized, and I think that it was Toshuka we call Crazy Horse that really realized that uh, they had to, to really raise their sons to die because they needed to leave behind this thing that they were not going to give up. And so came this thing, Hokahe, it's a good day to die. And, you know, I think, if, by the way, I think at that time, when they realized, this, again, this was Lionel Perry, when they realized we had to change our entire way of warfare because of what we were dealing with, it wasn't the going back and forth, you know, and counting coup and stealing horses. This was about wiping out entire people, killing children, sticking children in the bayonets like they did at Sand Creek. I mean, cutting out women's private parts, cutting off men's scrotum sacks and using them as tobacco bags, these kind of things. And they realized then that uh, uh, <clears throat> it was going to be have to be all out war. And they knew as well, they could see that the powers they were dealing with materially were overpowering, but they knew they had to leave behind memories for us, history for us to know not to give up, not to surrender until we had to surrender physically but we never surrendered spiritually, never. And so that, I think that, that's, that, a good, that's a good spot to bring back into Standing Rock, if I can, Phil. Sure. Um, a lot was done there, and it was done with the four colors coming together pretty much, uh, at least everything I saw. When Standing Rock, the protest there on the land stopped and the pipes went through, Many people saw it to be one, a fail. One, one, one second, my, my computer's about ready to run on a battery. Please. Okay. Just I just realized I saw that. If it happens, then that wouldn't be good. <laughs> that makes sure I got that. Yeah. Follow these little lines up here. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. I think I have it. Wait a minute. This is very strange here. One second. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's Here we go. Tech, tech gods. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not much of a tech person. I just know if, if to plug it in or not plug it in. Yeah. So somehow or another, it's not plugged in. Yeah, me too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, huh, it's strange. Hmm. Very strange. Okay. Huh. Oh, I see. There we go. No problem. I just didn't have a plug right here. Okay, please, please go back, go back over that, would you, Jim? So I get. To yeah. Okay. It. So when at Standing Rock, um, we did everything we did and and spread the word around the world and got all this connection, but eventually we had to stop the protest there, and and the pipelines came through, and so many people saw that as a failure. I never did. I see it as a complete success. Where, where's your? Well, you know, as I said, we're in a process, not an event. Um, what happened there was simply the first, uh, first step, so to speak. Uh, and it's continuing. What was born there, the spirit, 
in that 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 many wakoni water sacred is not ended just like we can see right here by the world the, the, the water laws and these things are going it hasn't ended it just got it started but what i think it's it, it really symbolizes the fact that that our relatives the human family were able to come together around something that was precious to all and that's water but also within the context of the indigenous uh, cultural spiritual uh, foundation which i think was so important because i think that's what held the whole thing together even though it's been shattered and hurt and broken still within that camp on that land there was a certain spirit that people felt like you said you felt you're coming home and something that drew people even the cold of winter to come there and i think that that kind of transcends this material world it transcends the material world Can I ask how did how did Standing Rock change you? What 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 hopes did it bring for you um, after witnessing and seeing that that convergence of heart? Well, um, to, to understand that, go back to the fact my, my to 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 my connection there with Standing Rock. Because my father was born there uh, in 1915 in Wakbala, along Oak Creek there. And he grew up there until he was 12 when he had, was my grandmother, Ella Delorius, sent him on to Haskell Indian School in Lawrence, Kansas, because uh, my grandmother had died from tuberculosis when he was five. And my grandfather um, went absent. So, uh, that had a great meaning to me from the time I can remember we would make our yearly pilgrimage back to Standing Rock and then when we could down to Yankton. But we'd always go there and first of all we'd go to the um, uh, St. Elizabeth's Mission there uh, where all the, the cemetery, the, the cemetery, a lot of relatives there. And we, every time we stopped there and go and offer tobacco and pray at all those graves. And there's another little cemetery there in Wakpala called St. Bede's. Um, we'd also go there and pray. Now, our direct relatives, so you can know kind of Ejna and I's connection. Um, my great grandfather's name was Tipisapa, Black Lodge, Philip Deloria. And Tipisapa was made, it was, was uh, um, there's a recount from my uncle Vine Deloria. I've got a lot of family history and things, but back when he was just 17 uh, is when they inaugurated him as, a, as one of their chiefs. And um, so as a, as a young man, he used to, when they first had, first of all, before the, the, Yankton came, first of all, his father, De, De Smith, that came, so the Catholics got there. And of course, in the treaties, you had no choice. You had to become a Christian. I, I don't think people realize that there, there was no choice here. Uh, it was it, it was against, as you know, until 1978 when they passed the Freedom of Indian Religion Act to practice our indigenous spirituality. Well, my great grandfather uh, would ride by this Episcopal church, this Anglican church, and of course, the difference between the white robes and black robes was the the uh, uh, the um, Catholics did everything in Latin and the Episcopals did everything in, in the native language. So, so first he shot arrows. I mean, literally shot arrows at that church, but every time he'd ride by, he was, he'd play this one particular hymn, number hymn number uh, 105, which is O Thou Great Jehovah in, in Dakota. And it touched him. It touched him. And he, so he walked in that church in full war regalia, I mean, he had a war, whatever, headdress and so forth and so on. Um, and in fact, I'll show you, this is, this is my great grandfather here. This is my great, great grandfather. 
this is the father of of um there we go that's the father of um tipi sapa and uh so um, when he came walking in that church uh the the uh minister said well he said you know uh, in order to become a member of the church, you're going to have to become a humble man and cut your hair and this and that and so forth. And he looked, there was a picture of Jesus. <laughs> his long hair. And so, and his robes and so forth. So he, he, he left. He said, I'm a powerful man. He left. But he came back eventually. He never gave up his chieftainship. In fact, he was there when they negotiated the, the pipe stone. You know, pipe stone belongs to the Ahantua. When they negotiated the pipe stone agreement, he, in 1895, I think he was kind of representing two. Anyway, right in there, he represented. Well, anyway, <clears throat> so what happened was because he had such a powerful uh, personality and, and influence, uh, and they were kind of scared of him there at Yankton, the, the Episcopal Church, they sent him up to Standing Rock in 1890. Now he arrives in Standing Rock in 1890, and you have, of course, Sitting Bull there um who who um he talked to by the way the night before he was assassinated or killed i shouldn't say assassinated but killed by um indian police which which uh, bullhead was the with bullhead was the was the uh, uh, leader of that indian police and for a long time there was a lot of disunity over that which probably still to the day that people have feelings about that but you know, you know, people were pressed into that situation. It wasn't that, that I don't think anybody meant to do this, but it happened. But the night before, he talked to Sitting Bull, and Sitting Bull uh, said that that well, he said, you know, if it's to be that I'm going to die like crazy horse, well, that's going to be. But I'm not going to surrender. Really, he had nothing to do with what was happening in the, of the uh, ghost dancing. He was just supportive of it. And they weren't doing anything anyway to hurt anybody. And so uh, at the same time, so anyway, he went up and and they opened this little church there and, at uh, Wakpala. And Chief Gall began to, to, to uh, uh, you know, really uh, watch this whole thing and he began to attend. In fact, there's a really funny story about um, when Chief Gall first came to a little church they had there and they said he came walking gall was a big man my grandmother martina sherwood used to sit i used to stay in the summer with her standing rock he said his hands were like this just boom and he'd been wounded he'd been shot several times at that at, at, uh, little bighorn at greasy grass so he had some big bullet holes where the bullets had gone through and she said he was just he's just this big man with so much love so 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 much uh, love and in fact it was uh, i shared with you before they made that first run from billy jean's bobby jean's vision they ran from his home where his home had actually been when well, anyway, gall comes sitting in there <clears throat> of course uh they had a place right by the fire it was it was really cold in the winter so they put him by the fire Yeah, he'd never been been to a to a church service, whatever. So he was sitting there. They came the time for the communion, and so they made that thick glass full of wine. And of course, he never he didn't he didn't know about communions. So of course, being the oldest, the oldest, uh, uh, and, and the chief, they brought him that chalice of wine first. Of course, he took the whole thing, drank the whole thing down. Handed it back. Didn't he did no expression. And so, of course, nobody said a word. Nobody laughed. Nobody said anything. And so they so they, they communion went on and so forth. And was that towards the end of the service? Well, just before the service ended, because here he was sitting by that hot stove. And he and he said that he said to my great grandmother, says, Me Sue, he says, younger brother, he says, he said, you know, I like this religion. I'm feeling better already. And that's a true story there they have to do so um uh now it's, it's what's so amazing about standing rock 
is that here you had a little uh, wounded knee happened was what about 1890 92 or 90 1890 1890 uh, December 29th 1890 tomorrow, tomorrow. 1890 and um, and yet by the time World War I started, every single member of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe was a member of the Red Cross. Even at the end of the 1890s, they were contributing and helping people out from the San Francisco earthquake. They, were, they had sent money over to the, uh, what's any of those relatives that were so persecuted by Turkey during World War I? Uh, anyway, I've got all that. Uh, they Armenians. Sent, uh, Armenians. Armenians. They, yes, actually, they actually sent help, financial help to Armenians. They actually sent financial help to the Chinese. And when it came time for World War I, over 5,000 Ihantua, Hunkpapa, Oglala's young men went to war. 5,000 went to protect this land. And of course, uh, you know, while the, the Ardenne relatives certainly were code talkers in World War II, in World War I, it was, the, it was other tribes, particularly uh, old, old, uh, uh, our elders there, uh, uh, Walter Strongheart, who gave me one of my names, Chantewashte. He, and I, I went to see, when I, when I got my name, I was a little guy, but he had one of his eyes gasped by the Germans. And, you know, uh, he taught, he told, he, he shared when I went and got my name all about what they did. And it was something, but can you imagine? This is after all these things happened, all these atrocities, but they lived up to their treaty. can't say that much about those who made the treaty, but indigenous people certainly have. You know, I got a kick out of my, my uncle of mine. He used to say, well, he says, you know, the US government uh, broke every single one of the 365 treaties, broke every promise except one. They promised to take the land and they did. <laughs> So at the same time, here's the one more, I'm gonna add this one more part. I'm kind of got me in a roll here. <clears throat> Back in 19, see, let, me, let me get my figures that are going here. Okay. Back in 1980, I was invited to go down to Rocky Boy Reservation to speak to their graduating high school class. Because in those young days, I, I you know, I was all about the environment and so forth and so on. And had a little bit different than I had black curly hair and I always wore a beaded belt buckle and you know, all that kind of things we did. Both, everybody kind of responded to the, to the early, uh, late sixties and kind of were you know, all gonna be Indian. So yeah, I even had new guys that used to bead their glasses. They used to bead their glasses and you know, bead everything, you know, bead everything. And I wanted to grow braids, I gotta tell you the truth. I really wanted to grow braids. But doggone, my hair was so curly. It looked like somebody plugged me in an electric light socket. I mean, my head, my braids go like this. And I go like this, you know. I even get some cream kind of, I wanted the people to know who I am. And finally, my dad just said, son, he said, some people can wear braids and some can't. He says, you're one of those that can't. He said, in the end, son, it's not going to make any difference. Because your braids will end up being little straggly things. He said, it's not important. And it's true. You can, can you imagine me with braids now? My gosh, I have hardly enough hair just to go this much, let alone braids, <laughs> you know? And so he says, that's not important. What's important is what's in here. In here, that's what's important. Not what's outside, but what's inside. That part. So, so anyway, I, I went to speak at Rocky Boy. And all the elders were pleased. You know, I talked about how we were such great environmentalists and how we treated her, da, 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 da. And, but I could tell there was one young man in that graduating class that just didn't get what I was saying. 
didn't get what I was saying. So I knew he's going to come and ask me a question. So I waited, of course, after any of our gatherings, we have to eat. That's, that comes with a dinner. Got to eat. We, after we we're eating, and he came to me, he said, you know, he said, Phil, he said, I listened to everything you had to say today, how great we were, how we loved our elders and this and that, and so how we raised children and hit children, all these kind of things. He says, you know, he said, I heard all that, but I got one question to ask you. If we love the creator so much, and we were so loyal to the creator and so, so took care of everything that was that was part that was the creators then why did he punish us why did god punish us that's what i want to know why did god punish us well <laughs> of course i i i listened to the elders enough by that time to realize and say to say uh, well he said i said that's a very good question I'm, i have to go pray about it i have to go you know kind of like but I didn't know the answer. But I was going up to, to fast up at Bear Butte before I sundance there at Standing Rock. And so I thought, well, I'm going to go up and I'm going to, to really ask about this question. And I'm going to ask also why, why did he receive my particular names I have given. And, you know, as I prayed there at Bear Butte and, you know, we, you know, go without food and water, then I began to understand. And all of a sudden it hit me. Bam, like that. And I thought about it, you know, when we go in the Anikaka, the sweat lodge to renew, Anipi, renew, renew a new breath of life. When we go in there, if we hold strong, even if it's really hot, we keep praying, 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 we come out of there, we're different. You go into a Sundance for four days and four nights, and you really keep praying, no matter what test, because you never know, you get tested different ways. Or whatever it is you do, you do the best you can, the best you can. And at the end of that ceremony, the end of that spiritual uh, process, you come out a better human being. Well, I want to suggest we just finished a 500-year Sundance, a 500-year su uh, sweat lodge in Ikaka. And we're stronger than we've ever been, ever been. Because we are, we are also on this plane of existence, you know, there is no death. Like Chief Seattle said, just to change the world. So who are we here? All those relatives who were wounded, were, were massacred or wounded, they're not dead. White Stone Hill, they're not dead. You can't kill that which is sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, everlasting. Yes, it leaves this physical world. But the spiritual power, collective, is right here with us. Each one of us represents all that have gone before us. And we're demonstrating in this last 500 years that you can bring armies, you can bring oil companies, you can bring extraction companies, you can bring the greatest forces of, of darkness. And we're going to demonstrate, and I'm demonstrating, not I'm talking about the spirit of all of us, that in the end, spirit will be victorious. That's a lesson. Spirit will be victorious. And spirit is becoming, is becoming more and more victorious. Thank you. That's beautiful, Phil. Thank you. Mm. Any finishing pieces, Angelique? Well, I would like to ask as we move forward, if there were three things that you could pull qualities or whatever, anything you would like, three things that you would like to really inculcate into um, this initiative as we move forward, now that we're out of the sweat lodge, now that we're feeling fortified and strong, what are the foundations of Standing Rock that you would like to see brought into this new space of the Rainbow Nation? Well, I think if you look at the foundation of the incredible indigenous peoples of Standing Rock, you'd have found at the very foundation spiritual values of kindness, compassion, generosity, um, dedication, courage. The whole, everything's there. But that's the same foundation that we all have. And if we're coming from that position, I'm a standing rock right here. 
if I'm coming from that position of kindness, compassion, strength, courage, justice, I'm standing right here in Standing Rock, the same place you're standing, the same place all of us are standing. Because the center of the universe is everywhere. <laughs> so I would say that, that the, the thing is to know where we're coming from. What's, what's our foundation here? What are our values here? First one of those, I think that is, is humility. And I think it's really important to understand that humility is humility before our creator. Before our creator. And, and we can't confuse humility with fear. Fear. So humility is feeling fully, fully empowered, fully infused with the holy power. But realizing completely and totally that is humility before our creator, and that means humility before our creator's natural laws. So humility, you know, that, that realizing that we uh, completely give ourselves to serving the will of this higher power. And we know as well, that's the will of our ancestors as well. This is all connected. And then, of course, um, justice. Justice, I believe, is an organizing principle as we move into the future. Because once we understand oneness, oneness, and justice means that all is treated in oneness, quality, equity. So justice, to me, is a foundation principle, justice. And from justice we build because it's the restructuring of our relationships as our relationship with mother earth our relationship between us as human beings and our relationship now together on all of mother earth that's what we're defining and i, I really believe we're way way ahead of the pack on that indigenous people I mean, we have from the meetings we had beginning in 1982 a solid set of 16 guiding principles we know have been validated across the Americas by indigenous people. We have principles of consultation, which we also have agreement because there are natural principles of consultation. We have guiding principles of talking circles, how human beings can come together. We began in 2009 to forge the treaty International Treaty to Protect and Restore Mother Earth, which was signed on uh, April 22nd, 2016. At the same time, they were signing the Paris Climate Change Accord Agreement in, in um, the United Nations in New York. We were at a little kind of a humble location, uh, close enough we were able to buy canoe if we would have, would these police boats would have stopped us, we could have gotten there. But we had the Haudenosaunee come down in canoes. Humbly, we signed this treaty. Went in canoes. We had loaded a, prepared a pipe. We went out as far as we go. Two big police boats came. And we offered that pipe there. That treaty. <clears throat> that treaty uh, was born, really, from that whole spirit as well of Standing Rock. And you'll see dimensions of that treaty, a direct reflection of Standing Rock and other places across the Americas and other places around the world about how do we address runaway climate change. There is no other, other um, treaty, or no other uh, position, holistic position regarding climate change, particularly runaway climate change anywhere on Mother Earth. That, that, and I think it's due to the fact that it, it was developed out of the out of the collaboration or consultation with indigenous people. We started in 2009 at the International Indigenous Leadership Gathering uh, by the Statler Nation hosted by them. And we met every year about it from there. From there, we went down to Rio plus 20 and that's where we met with Marcos and all those relatives, all those Amazonians. We shared it there. 
uh, we went to the indigenous summit of the Americas at the same time all the presidents and, and so forth were meeting there in Panama City. And uh, that's quite a story in itself. We got ratification unanimously there in other places. So we know and you go through that treaty and, and now it's been reaffirmed. You know, through this enlightening our way together between the 11th and, and 22nd of December, the International Treaty of Protecting Restore Mother Earth was ratified again, was reunited, so to speak, moving forward. And many people are beginning to hear what we were saying then. And by the way, in three articles of that treaty, it talks about women having should have rights over the reproductive life and other kinds of issues, uh, the poisoning of, of women. By these toxins, etc. So it's, it's it's really powerful, but it came from consultation, which, by the way, was finalized over in at the uh, uh, Paris Climate Change uh, meetings uh, in December uh, 2015. And we came together at a place called the Chateau Millamont, and we had all these relatives come. For, you know, right. Um, there. There's whole numbers of young people, Reuben George, and these all these young people, and, and um, John Liu, who's a great uh, scientist, and Rick, uh, Rex Weiler, many relatives from Europe, from Hawaii, and so forth. And we 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 took this report we had, the critical state of Mother Earth, that Rex Weiler and I uh, put together. And it's when you read this, you see what wow. We're so consumed with this partisan political bat bittering, backering, bittering, bickering. <laughs> We're missing something going on here. That is, this environmental thing is going down. Thank God, I mean, at a certain level, this coronavirus came along because we are plunging right over the edge to climate change. Stopped, slowed things down, but we're still moving that way. And if you think it's going to be business as usual after these vaccines or whatever, I'll tell you, then we're going to jump clear off the cliff. So that was confirmed. So that's sitting there. It's, it's right there. This is from indigenous people from across the Americas. It was signed there in New York City by indigenous representatives across the Americas, but also, interestingly, Indonesia. Now, of course, it's, it's continued to, to grow and expand and so forth. So that's one dimension. I think the other thing that's very significant in terms of the spirit of Standing Rock and the sharing and the, the, the whole different way of being with one another. I think that's one of the things there, being with one another. People are able to come and be with each other in a different way than they've been able to do in this other colonial context, colonial structures we live in. But I think that, that um, um, one of the things now is that is that the union, the union of the Condor, the Quetzal and Eagle was formed at 5.44 p.m. June 20th, 2020. That's, that's spiritual fact, spiritual reality. This union has now connected, by the way, I'm not talking about every single person, but every digital network in the Americas that connects indigenous people are now connected. This is the emergence of the first digital nation upon Mother Earth. And just in 11 nation states, there's 78 million indigenous peoples. 78 million. The fourth largest nation state in the Americas. We have the youngest population in the Americas and, and right, at the, right along in the world, right in there, and the fastest growing population. The Americas, by far. When you collectively shrug off all these colonial borders, we have the natural resources and the human resources, emerging human resources, that no other nation state of that size could compete with us on Mother Earth, including Thailand, which was about the same size. Now, this doesn't include all those relatives across the Americas and, and different who are awakening to their own indigeneity. 
whether it be indigeneity to because they have direct relationships to this the hemisphere, at least genetically here, or if it means they're connecting to their roots in Europe or Russia or wherever it is. Because it's reconnecting and finding our foundation, which is the foundation of the whole thing. So um, what happened was <clears throat> Uh, the elders who, who, who came together between Christmas and New Year's, 1982, right at this very time, we're talking about this, 1982, we were sitting in ceremony. Four days, ceremony. The last night was, Dece was December 29th. And that night was, by the way, you look it up, there was a full eclipse of the moon right in there. So we started that night about seven o'clock. I remember my dad was there. He really did his back. He really hurt his back on the horse, but he sat there. And there was about, there must have been maybe 60 of us. On the left-hand side here, we had the, the Kainai nation. We had Rufus Goodstriker, George Goodstriker, um, Rose Yellowfee, all these relatives here. We came on around this way, and then uh, right, right, uh, right, straight across from me uh, was my uncle. And then we came back. My dad was sitting on this side. We came back around. Anyway, all these tribes. And <clears throat> what 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 we'd done is we'd come together, and uh, this Paul. Uh, uh, a person that came up in Canada, Paul Kaiba, who I'd met earlier when Harold Cardell took over, um, uh, or tried to take over Saskatchewan. Well, he did take over as head of uh, Indian Affairs in Saskatchewan. They eventually took him out because he was just too, he wanted to make the real changes. So they were thinking about me coming up there. But anyway, he came to me and he said, You know, Phil, he said, uh, I was at the University of Lethbridge. It's 19, this had been, had been in the about, October 1981. He said, Phil, he said, we have some end of the year monies. And they used to have those end of the year monies. He said, he said, I'm wondering um, if we gave you $100,000, um, could you develop a um, curricula, a, a, a strategy for preventing alcoholism? Alcohol and drug abuse, but it wasn't drugs weren't that big. I said, well, I said, you know, by that time, I at least learned enough. I said, well, you know, Paul, I'll tell you what, I, I, this, that's just, when you think about all these different nations and all these different languages and all these different cultures and so forth, but I'll tell you what, I'll give it a shot. If you'll allow me to use these monies any way I choose, meaning that I want to bring together about 40 elders across Canada, if we can get some from the United States to come in, and uh, I want to, to ask them the question and get their support and so forth and so on. He said, and I said I want, also I want approval from Health Canada that I can, I can give them tobacco. You guys aren't gonna come down on me because you're, you're anti-tobacco thing, this, you know, and blankets and so forth and so on. I wanna, so he said, okay. So we called this gathering uh, right as we speak right now, 1982. And um, so we, we, and I even, in those days, he had these big mainframe computers. I even went in there and had, I couldn't do it, but I had some, can you see how many small groups we have to have so all the elders get a chance to sit with each other? So we had a large group and we had small groups. Well, when we, well, we so anyway, we came to the night of the 29th, tomorrow night. And so the first thing that happened was, uh, was I had flesh offerings taken. This is how serious it was. Two of us took flesh offerings. This one brother cut them too. He really cuts them. But I, I thought he was light, but he was heavy. Anyway, I remember that we took that. I took that blood and I put it on that pipe. And uh, this is very private, but I'll share it with you. It'll eventually come up. But in, on, in, on December 29th, on uh, December 29th, 1980, Dashunkui Kuo's pipe, one of his pipes was passed over to my care. 
and I've carried it ever since. It's 1980, it'll be 40 years tomorrow night we carried that sacred pipe. So we used that pipe, took that blood. The other brother who, who shared, who, who sat with me that night helped me. He's gone, gone on, uh, Eagle speaker. So we started those prayers songs all night until the sun rose on the 30th of December. And we and, and what we did was by by doing this, we drove our stake in the ground. So from here we shall not surrender. We shall go forward until these visions that our elders have given us are fulfilled. And it's really interesting when we distilled what all those 40 elders shared with us, it came down to something very simple, but profound, powerful. They said this, they said, this universe we live in is organized according to certain natural laws. These physical and spiritual laws are inseparably connected. Separately. So it's easy to understand the physical laws. If you jump off a 10 story building on your head, you're gonna get a headache. You drink a great big glass of arsenic and a stomach ache. You drive 100 miles an hour into a concrete wall, you're gonna get smashed up. There are natural physical laws. But at the foundation of these are the spiritual laws, which by the way, can influence the physical realm of existence because a physical realm of existence emerges from the spiritual realm. They said those natural spiritual laws, if you follow those laws, those guiding principles, you will be victorious. You will be. And so they gave us four. The first one they shared with was development comes from within. Others can help and assist, but it must emerge from the individual, the family, the community, the tribe, the nation, and the world, so to speak. Development comes from within. The second one they gave us was no vision, no development. Developing people need a vision of possibility. By the way, I, from my perspective, the most powerful vision we can give to any, anywhere is our own self as it reflects the creator. Better, better than any book, any video, whatever. That's what children relate to most. And then they said that no participation, no development. Everybody, you bet it from the youngest child, the oldest elder, everybody's going to be part of it. Inclusion. And the fourth one was that we are spiritual as well as physical beings. Spiritual and physical beings. So we begin, you know, so, so that, that's, that's, that's where we begin. And then it comes up. Now, if you look, for instance, 1985, we published The Sacred Tree, which is now published in, I don't know, so many languages and we, we got attacked at the beginning for because we we, we were called well um what do they call it you know and i have total respect every tribe but there's also cultural universals you know we're kind of like pan indian it's pan being pan indian but the fact is the sacred tree is not just universal to us it's universal to every single culture in the entire mother earth planet that doesn't mean it's cultural appropriation it just simply means we have to understand that these certain archetypes are shared by everybody. So you have the, the thing of the sacred, so we, we, sacred tree, Dr. Lee Brown uh, and, and myself and, and two of the, the uh, doctors working with us in the project put together this, this sacred tree. It's really essentially, by the way, it's essentially if you go back and look into uh, and there at Standing Rock or Yankton, even the way our colors, the medicine wheel are all from there. But by the way, that's another thing. <clears throat> things that have spiritual meaning have infinite. Uh, spiritual things have infinite meaning, infinite. So the, this idea of getting fighting over a medicine wheel looks this way, it means that is so foolish. It's why Christianity is now broken, our churchianity is now broken into 3,000 different sects because they get over fighting over Bible scriptures. 
So what I'm saying is, is that how I might interpret something spiritually might be something different than somebody else. That doesn't make me right or them wrong or my me wrong and them right. It just means that we see this thing spiritually different because it's infinite. So, um, but we're spiritual beings. It's important. And, you know, then they, they, we, they, we, we applied those. We applied, literally applied those for four years. We applied these in all kinds of contexts. We started our Four World Summer Institute. Then in 1987, February 1987, we called a second gathering. A hundred elders came. Uh, remember, it was when Orville, uh, my younger cousin Orville was younger, or Tanshi Orville came. Uh, oh, there's so many great spiritual leaders that have gone on. William Commanda, that's where I met William Commanda came. My father came. Um, oh, you look, there's a hundred. You look at these elders, they were like a rose yellow feet, rosy day chief. Uh, it, it just couldn't believe it. I mean, it was just, we had it for seven days um, out on the blood reserve. And it's very interesting because right where we prayed, at, where we had that ceremony, that last night ceremony, the rest of the things were held in the left bridge for the university. But um, when we had that ceremony at that old broken down residential school, uh, the most interesting happened. When we came back four years, a little, a little over four years later, a brand new treatment center had been built there. Brand new. That's where we held the seven day meeting of elders. We got a lot of photographs from that. And it was there that that we moved from the four in here. Thank you, thank you. You have to excuse me. I've never told this story before. I've never shared this before, and I know I've gone on, but I just- This is incredible. I, I will be listening to this, I don't know how many times. I'm, I'm just sitting here, but, but I know I'm gonna lose my Zoom shortly. Oh, okay, okay. So, so we started, uh, wrap us up, time. wrap us up. Blessing time. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Time. thank thank you, thank you, Mukashi. Uh, uh, but you know, some I really want to talk some more about this sometime. Can we, I, I would love to. Now that I, I've never even looked at this until now, but I can take you back and and and, and historically, I can tell you every kind of the whole how this has unfolded. I would and, like to set up another follow up. Yeah, let's set up a follow up. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Good. That would be awesome. Okay. Well, I've just enjoyed myself. Thank you so much. Yes. Yay. Thank you, Brother Phil. Thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon and, and taking time out of your schedule and sharing such beautiful history and such rich history and um, gifts to move forward in this new uh, paradigm that we're creating, such a beautiful foundation to um, move from with these natural laws and these codes for all humanity. Thank you. True. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. We will set something up soon, Phil. Yes, absolutely. Bye-bye. Blessings. Blessings. Blessings.